on the news we would have seen what way to go to school or what way to go to work where somebody had been killed or where a bomb had went off. There's been a bomb there last night, the streets blew up, so we're going to go the other way to school. And it was just so normal. And you wasn't like feeling adrenaline or like, no, you know? No, because bombs going off, hearing news about somebody you went to school with, unfortunately dying, but it became so normal. What does that do to you? Entrepreneur. Man, the myth, the legend. Hardest working man in the city. The boss of all bosses. Tom Spade. And then at the age of 18, turning 19, I bought my first house. Wow, that's a, that's a massive accomplishment. My lads were all laughing at me in the pub. You're buying a house. Yeah, I'm going to buy a house. But I sat in the pub and everybody was drinking, looking at property brochures. But a house that I bought for 30 or 34,000 quadrupled within about 14 months. And people were all saying, you're a lucky guy. No, hard work meets opportunity. It's called being lucky. If discipline and motivation was a person, then I've got him here in a room. They say, well, actually, he says, the more handshakes you make, the more calls you make, the more money you make. Let's welcome Tom Smith. What's happening, How's brother? it going? Yeah, really good. Yes, yeah, yes. Good to see you. How? <laughs> How's <laughs> it going, you, man? For, thank you very much for having me. Um, oh, do you know what? The pleasure is all ours. We know, like, you know, the biggest thing you can give anybody is your time. Totally, yeah. You know? And it's, it's my biggest asset. Um, but the thing is, I feel privileged for the opportunity. So, you know, I want to reach out to all your connections and stuff to, yeah. to see if I can maybe touch on somebody, if wow. I can help them. So I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. How do you have so much gratitude for the smallest things? Like to me, it could be a very small podcast. You've accomplished so many things in your life. You've been on so many big platforms, big stages, you know, TED Talking Speaks. How mm. do you still be thankful just coming but, to a you know, small I, thing I, like I, this that's today? That's the bit people don't get. You know, it's gratitude is for the amazing guy who served us our coffee two hours ago. Mm -hmm. Gratitude for me was getting into a taxi outside the Shard and the taxi driver being from Belfast. I'm like, mm -hmm. what's happening, brother? Yeah. You know, gratitude is, it, is watching the sunrise or the sunset. Yeah. Gratitude isn't everything you do. You know, thank you should be coming out of your mouth all the time. It's not about Rolexes, Lamborghinis and all that nonsense. Yeah. Gratitude should be, have you got food in your fridge? Have you got an iPhone? Did you have a hot shower this morning? Mm -hmm. All of us are billionaires. Think about the millions of people that have zero, that dream of our lives. Gratitude is pumping through my veins. And sometimes I have to click my fingers and say, whoa, 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 think how lucky you are. You know, if you live with an attitude of gratitude, you just shine. You know, for when I was checking into the hotel today, I just said to the two guys, thank you so much today. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. And sprinkle gold dust on them. And the female manager says, sir, we've just upgraded both your rooms. I'm like, of course you have. <laughs> thank you. Like, it you know, costs you, nothing. Do you believe that? And I can, I can actually confirm that because since the first time we messaged each other, I felt like no one's ever spoken to me like, hey, thank you, sir. Um, the mannerisms that you have mm. at your level it goes a, such a long way. Mm. Um, do you believe that energy that you send out, you attract that energy back? Of course, but you know, my grandmother Lily is, is, has died now, but before she died, she used to say to me, manners are free. Yeah. Like if I can't address you being respectful, what's the point? Yes. And then equally you reciprocate it and you get it back. Like we're both sitting here, like we've known each other all our lives. Yeah, it's true. Because we're on the same frequency. Yes, we are, definitely, you know? for sure. And real recognises real, I always say that. Big time. Did you come from like um, Ireland today or, or how I long flew over, I got up at 3.30. <laughs> wow. Um, I had my bags all packed. I wrote my gratitude and my mantra and my goals. Yes. I got onto the flight, um, I scanned and I'm able to like speed read. Uh, I went through 420 emails. Wow. The plane was delayed slightly in the air, so it suited me, it cleared me in box. Wow. Um, we've went to the Shard, we've went to Tar 42, which I was telling you about in a minute, yes. I'm sure you'll bring that up. Um, we got a really lo lovely London cab driver brought us here. Um, we're, we're shooting a day in the life of Tom Smith, the entrepreneur. Yes. And uh, we're having a really good time. And I'm so used to being in the grind, yeah. but I'm still working today. Of this course. is work. Of course. Um, but yeah, everything's through it. your message. Flew from Belfast and we're ready to go. <clears throat> Before we move on, what, what's the difference between Dublin and Belfast? Because I want to oh, hear it from an Irish no. person. Have, have I just said something wrong now? Yeah. What's the difference? <laughs> well, I'll get beat up. <laughs> yeah, no, I suppose it's a touchy subject. You yeah. see, you know, I, we, our country, Northern Ireland, yes. 
Some people may call it Ireland, depending on what religion you are. It is a touchy subject. See, I'm a Protestant. Half of the community in Northern Ireland or Ireland are Catholic. Right. So our country is built up of six counties. I am British. My wife is a Catholic. She's Irish. It's very complicated. But um, I suppose the thing for me, I never ever thought in my lifetime that I would see peace. Mm -hmm. And now both our communities are together. Mm -hmm. And our community leaders have done an amazing job um, signing the Good Friday Agreement. Yes. I think it was 25 years ago. Um, and our, co still... our country now has peace. So, you know, the children growing up now don't remember what it was like. We grew up in a war. Yes. We had a 30-year conflict where murder and terror was part of our daily life. Our insane, abnormal life was normal to us. Yes. You know, and uh, I, I just got goose pimples are thinking about it. I am so proud of our country. Like, we are the ultimate country that bounced back. Yes. And now we're a tourist destination. We've got amazing restaurants and bars, golf courses, hotels, mm -hmm. amazing people. It's amazing because I remember in the early 90s, I used to see these on the news, like bombs going off and of these tractors, the but RA, was, uh, you know, yeah, bombers. Well, I suppose and both sides had terrorist organisations. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the guys who were in these organisations decided to put the guns down mm -hmm. and they listened to the people. Yes, and now we'll have peace. And I, I, I just, it's a miracle. Yeah. But we are the definition of conflict resolution. If we can do it, any country can do it. 100%. So let's hope the Ukraine and Russia maybe find it. But because we had a really bitter war for 30 odd years, and now uh, it's not there. I can't believe in this day and age that we're still going through that. Like, why two, yeah. two, two governors or two prime ministers, two people in charge of the country can't sit down and just talk it out? Why can that not happen? Communication's everything, you know, and it's just, you know, that's, I would, like, what's the point in going to war with somebody when you can make somebody your partner or your friend? And, you know, Northern Ireland, there was a famous saying, hands across the barricades. Mm. And that, that happened, you know, and it's now... Like, it's such an amazing place to but live. But you must appreciate life so much now, oh, like, you know, because yeah. I heard about wars in the north of uh, India, Pakistan, yeah. when the partition happened, and my granddad said we lost everything, mm. and we had to walk with bare feet. You know? Yeah, like, you know, my mum and dad are both 71 years old, and they're still alive, and I'm very lucky to have them. But my dad was a postman, he's retired, he's a, he works for a big company now where he's a, a car taker, uh, and my mum is a car worker. But, like... We, my mum and dad used to watch the news when we were children mm -hmm. because on the news we would have seen what way to go to school or what way to go to work where somebody had been killed wow. or where a bomb had went off. And it would have been, okay, my mummy would have said, Tommy, we're not going that way today. Why, love? There's been a bomb there last night. The streets blew up, so we're going to go the other way to school. Wow. And it was just so normal. Wow. Um, and the conflict took its toll on everybody. Um, and for me, it made me resilient. I remember at the age of 18, 19, I was a contractor mm. and I earned more money than everybody else that was a contractor. Why? I get paid a thing called danger money because I worked for the security forces. So we worked on police stations and army bases. So we were a target. And I remember one time working on the police forensic lab, the policeman came running out and says, get off the roof. And I'm like, why? He says, we've had intelligence. There's a sniper in the forest. Wow. So we were about to just start getting popped off the roof. No. So what did we do? We, we got down and had our lunch. The, the, the army helicopter went up. The police went into the forest. And I went, well, they're bound to be away now. Let's get back up and put the roof on. <laughs> But it was the insanity of it became so normal to wow, you. Wow, wow. And, and you wasn't like feeling adrenaline or like, no, you know. No, because bombs going off, hearing news about somebody you went to school with, unfortunately dying, mm. just became, unf it was horrible, but it became so normal. You know, and. What does that do to you? Well, it's definitely affected a lot of people. I think it's given me resilience and, and strength. Um, you know, a situation either controls you or you control it. And it's now put me to the point where I'm getting to high level meetings. People are like, are you a bit nervous getting into the meeting? <laughs> no chance. I've been around I'm bombs. i Belfast, mate. <laughs> you know, the resilience is in my DNA. Yeah. Um, and it's just made me appreciate life. It's made me really appreciate peace. Yeah. Um, and it's made me really appreciate waking up in the morning. But see the thought of my kids growing up in a country with no war. You're just like, sometimes you have to pinch yourself and go, how amazing is this? Yes. You know, how amazing is this? And 
for young people growing up, I'm so glad that they've no idea what it was like. 100. What do you think of social media nowadays? Because everyone is scrolling, looking for that dopamine hit. You know, they're looking for something to make them feel good every single day. Mm. And when they see somebody on a private jet, for example, mm. or sitting in Dubai, sipping cocktails, etc., what do you think of them like in terms of they're, they're always looking for the next high? Yeah, the dopamine hit that you need is inside you. You should be looking for it internally. Social media should be there the way we use social media. We, are, we use social media as a personal brand to grow our business, to put a message out, to maybe touch on one person to help them. Um, I use social media as a tool. Like if you really want to get that high, hard work pays off. Mm -hmm. Don't be sitting scrolling on your reels. How long have you been on? Oh, fuck, I've been stuck on my reels for 45 <laughs> minutes. Why? Could you not be spending 45 minutes on a business program yes. or a self-development course yes. or a business plan? Mm. Like, it doesn't exist on social media. Like, I'm a guy, I'm 49 years old. When we grew up, we didn't have mobiles. No. We didn't have social media. And if somebody's hating on me or anything like that, really, it is what it is. Yeah. If somebody is looking for that life, the Instagram life, it's fake. Go and get that life. Mm. Do two or three jobs. Mm. Work your ass off. Mm. That's where it's at. Mm. It's not on social media. That's that's a lie. Yes, yes, yes. Do you agree? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. I mean, like I was saying the other day, people are looking for this next high. And I'm like, when was the last time you put your phone away and just enjoyed your breakfast? Oh, man. I, when did I, you I'm enjoy so... that, 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 that feeling? It's, it's hitting your tongue, the flavours, the emotions yeah. that I've got to eat today and someone in the world is not eating. But I, but there's your gratitude. You and know? I get it. You know, one of the things that I teach my clients is all about the reset, about coming off that phone that is infecting you. And one of the things that I do every Sunday, I put my phone away. Mm and see the best version of me, he always turns up on a Monday, because I've been off my phone from anything, yeah. from six to 20 hours on a Sunday. I'm completely off it. You start breaking away, you feel you're in the present moment. I'm looking at my beautiful wife in the eyes. Yes. I can play with my dogs and I'm playing with my dogs. Mm -hmm. Even my little dog, I've got two dogs, Romeo and Pandora. Romeo has taught himself, if you're sitting on your phone, he knocks it out of your hand. Oh, wicked. Because he wants your attention. <laughs> And so he should. Yes. But like, I totally agree with you. Enjoying a bowl of cereal, being in the present moment, watching a sunset. Yes. That's what it's you all about. You can't put money on it. You can't buy it. You can't buy that feeling at all. You seem like somebody who's very organized. You've got <laughs> processes. Yeah. Everything's on timing. ADHD. You know, you know well, I, I can resonate with that because yeah. everything in my day, I need to know exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. Even today, coming to this podcast, I know what car I'm driving. I know I've got my training bag there. Um, yeah. So I can train sometime during the, the in the middle of the day. I've but you're an efficient, successful bag, entrepreneur you know? because of that too. Yeah, but we do it s subconsciously yeah. now because we're like, I've got to do these, these things. I need all of these things. I've got to wear them trainers and then I've got to have spare ones for the running ones and then I can yeah. change back in. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm going to dinner to... I've got my jacket, etc. How do you how do you get to that position? How do you get so organized and you know it, it runs to the outside world? It's easy, like wow, he's just appeared, he's just done this. But to you, you know the work you have to put in behind well, yeah, the scenes. And, and it's it's lovely that you have recognized that. You know, being or organized at that level does take work, but it's having an amazing support network of a gorgeous wife and two daughters that support yes. me. Yeah. It's about coming home to a family home and people just think. You know, um, a woman can do a certain job. My wife runs our house. Yeah. She's a she's an absolute warrior of a person. Mm -hmm. She helps me be organised. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, for me, I will polish my shoes if I'm wearing a suit. I'll have my watch sitting. I'll have my suit ready. Yes. I'll have my gym bag. Yeah. You know, I'll have my goals and gratitude book sitting with my pen. My coffee's ready to go. When I wake up, I'm just a complete organised machine. Yes. But it's I didn't wake up that guy. No. I built that person. No. You know, and I make every second count. And I and here's the thing, I never put time between me and a task. I just do stuff mm -hmm. there and then. Well, you've had quite a tough bringing up and we're gonna go to your story a little bit as mm -hmm. well. But somebody who hasn't had it hard in life, who's never had, who's had, yeah, I've got two great parents. They both go to their nine to five. Yeah. I've never gone without. There's no reason for me to do anything extra. I've had a good education. Mm -hmm. I'm in the matrix, I'm in my nine to five. 
But yeah, I want something a little bit maybe boring in life, but there's nothing pushing me. Like, I haven't felt pain that, you know, sometimes mm. when you come from pain, you go, I don't, I never want to feel that for me or of my course. children in the future. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're working so hard. No matter how far you get away from it, it's that thing that's always driving you deep, deep down. Oh, yeah. It's them the young feelings. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how do you put that into somebody? How do you put that feeling mm. of you need to go through pain you you need this you need to do yeah, this in you your life you have to find the trigger in somebody you know if it's making somebody stop smoking if it's making somebody go to the next level you have to find a trigger of you know do you want your next generation to be proud of you can you stand and look at yourself in the mirror and go i love that woman or i love that guy find the trigger that makes him go you know something you're right and I've had a real top amazing client who's a property guy who had said to me one of the reasons I work with you is because you've had that tough upbringing and I want, I didn't I had a silver spoon upbringing mm -hmm. uh, I want to learn the mental mindset toughness yeah. because you need to have that as an entrepreneur I'm also you know people might think I'm also a very soft loving person yeah. you know I am people just seem to see this guy who's running stairs and flying in jets and all that stuff I also have a very big heart. Yes. But, but you, you it's don't... about finding that little spot on somebody and then it's working on it and tweaking it and changing it and showing them and showing them that their own self worth and they're like, do you know something? I do deserve more. It's making somebody realise they should love themselves. Mm -hmm. I, I love themselves enough to be proud of themselves. You know, that's where it's at. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. I really do. So tell me, Tom, like, what is one of the biggest projects that you're doing right now? The man, dream mentor, my mentor and self-development course is definitely the biggest thing for me. Um, you know, it's so rewarding when you're working with people yeah. and especially like Richard, even my videographer, he's been on my course. He's a one-to-one -one client now. Uh, he walked away from a 15-year job in security. Wow. And you're seeing people apply tactics that you're teaching them. And the most rewarding thing is seeing them succeed. It's not about me. It's about seeing them and to become the biggest version of themselves. Mm -hmm. And Dream Mentor now is starting to become a global business. Um, in, my, in February, I was over training planes dentistry in Cocoa Beach in Miami. All these amazing people. My friend, Dr. Alex, flew me over. I trained all his staff. The other day, I'm proud to now say, I've signed a huge deal with Grant Cardone, yes. the American yes, billionaire. Yes, yes, We're yes, doing yes. a huge public speaking event in Warsaw in Poland. And I've got Grant involved. And, that's, uh, that's, I, I don't. I think you need to spend a little bit more time on that because that's a massive achievement. Yeah, I'm so. I'm, I'm had, absolutely delighted. I've had people come on this podcast who pay twenty five thousand to spend three days with him on a yacht, for example, mm -hmm. and they were like, "It's worth every penny being around yeah. a billionaire." Um, but you, you're doing co you're co eventing with, with, with well, yeah. With so like you know, um, I have the utmost respect for Grant and his team, Jared as president and stuff, and. You know, when I was going through COVID, I had listened to his book, 10X, 17 times. And I realized there is other people that ha have the same belief as me. I reached out, I became part of the team. I became a Grant Cardone licensee. I met Grant last year. Jared is right hand man and president. I, I'm very proud to call him a close friend. Mm -hmm. um, so then I reached out and just said, guys, I'm taking this to the next level here. We're going to do a huge public speaking event. There's only one person on the planet that we want, and it's, it's Mr. Cardone. And we agreed in negotiated terms on Grant's basis. They're the decision makers. A bit of negotiations on our end, and we got there. And on the 2nd of December, Grant's going to be speaking live, being broadcast from Miami, live on stage in Poland. Wow. And then he's going to be introducing me on the stage. So, What does it feel like being next to a billionaire like that? The thing, see the thing for me, like I've grew up in Northern Ireland and in a war and you know people would always say to me, like nothing fizzes on you Tom. I just address people the way they are yeah. and, I, and I deliver somebody, I, I just deliver myself as I am yeah. and nothing like that really ever impresses me. I take somebody for what they are at face value. You know, the, the cab driver, the billionaire, everybody's the same to me. Same. You know, when I'm walking in the, the tube station and somebody's cleaning the toilets, I treat them like I treat the billionaire. Man, can I just say thanks very much for cleaning the toilets today? Yeah. What does that cost for me to be it do, it a doesn't. nice guy to that guy? But so many people don't understand this. I sometimes I'm in a room, and I'm not saying I'm the biggest one in the room, but I I know that you know my level etc. But I'm just normal, and they act like they're my dad. Do you know what I mean? They, mm. they, they've got maybe half a million, a million, and they're going, oh, do this or showing off or flamboyant or what you car see, do you that, drive it's that just would, like that would bother me i yeah. just like people being real exactly i really do and 
whether you're billionaire level, millionaire level, whatever, if you're a normal, real person, you're so much more respected. But why do people hold money as this big trophy that they have more of it in their pocket and they're worth more than you? I think them people are usually the people that don't have the money and they're fake. Anybody who I know has lots of money doesn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. They don't, because they don't need to. Like I have a friend back home who would do a lot of funding for me in the property development. He's worth, I think, 250 million, 300 million. And he's one of the coolest people you'll ever meet. He drives a Volkswagen transporter. He comes in in a pair of combat trousers and a body warmer. Um, he owns a huge big company and he would just, he sits and talks to you like he's my grandpa yeah. and he's the coolest guy and you wouldn't know for a second what he has. He's the real deal mm -hmm. instead of some dude talking in millions. This guy doesn't need to talk about it, he has it. Yes, 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 yes. People got to recognise that because people want to see a flashy watch, they want to see the Lambo, they want to see a little bit of your lifestyle that might be a little bit of holiday mm -hmm. and they go, I want to be next to that guy. And that yeah. guy is full of air, yeah. has nothing behind him at yeah, all. Yeah, the thing about, you know, the Rolexes are all my watches. The Lambo's my car. You know, when I'm on a jet, I'm renting the jet. Whereas I think now a lot of this social media stuff, the guy doesn't own the car. He's borrowed the watch and he's paid to go on and sit yes. on a jet instead of fly on it. So be careful who you circle with. Yes, you know, I am really choosy who I would call a friend or I'd be very choosy on who I ask advice from, you know. How much is it to rent a jet? Depends where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your goal. Okay, okay. Look, Tom, I want to go a little bit more into your journey. Mm. You know, I want to I want to hear what that 10-year-old boy was doing. You know, you've mm. said a little bit about the environment and the conditions, but when was money a thing for you? When was did it come important? But you just hit the nail you know? on the head there. You got it, 10 years old. Mm -hmm. um, when I was 10 years old, we were growing up in a war. My mummy and daddy, um, like most people in Northern Ireland, Ireland, whatever, um, were struggling. You know, back in the 70s, everybody was flat ass broke. And some of my friends were getting like the best tracksuits and the best trainees because there was a thing called Kay's catalog. Everybody used the order from the catalog and they paid it off. But my mum and dad didn't believe in debt or bringing extra debt to the family home. So my friend's sister got me a job working in a fish and chip shop. And I was the kid who walked, went to the chippy five days a week. I peeled the potatoes. I cut the potatoes and the chips from a machine and I put them in the huge big baths, just like the bath you get into at home. And sometimes in the winter, it was so cold and I'd been standing out the back of this chippy, shaking in a warm bucket of water just to try and keep me warm. So the young entrepreneur was born at the age of, age of 10 because there's times I would have looked at the money box and thought, I put that money there. And there was other times I would have saved up three or four weeks and bought myself the tracksuit. So I realised money gave me a choice in life. And it, it was just, it was the game changer for me. What was your parents like? Uh, did they push you to work? Did they say you need a job or was no, it something you wanted to do like, yourself? I just wanted to do it. I've always had that grind. You know, one of the things my mum would say to me when I was a kid, where did we get you son the movies? Because I just seen things differently. Yes. There might have been a war going on, but I still had vision that I was going somewhere else. How was um, things academically in school? Yeah, man, I was terrible in school. I remember my physics teacher saying to me, Tom, get Billy and sit over there, son. What do you mean, sir? Just go out. Are you happy to look at the cars? Yes, sir. Just sit out and look at them cars and please leave the class alone. Um, and recently I found that I've got ADHD. So concentrating in school wasn't really a thing for me. Mm -hmm. My master plan was already going on in my head what I was going to do. Okay. Um, so academically, physical education, loved it. Religious studies, loved it. Everything else, hated no. it. Hated it. Do you think the school system is designed for everybody? Do you think it is, is to, I, I think, to born entrepreneurs or do you think I think it's teachers do an amazing job. I think the syllabus is failing us. You know, I think kids should be shown how to open a business. There should be a section on how to run a social media campaign for a business. You know, well, how to open a bank account, more business studies, more about real life mm -hmm. instead of the syllabus well, needs change. It hasn't been changed in 50 years. I mean, like social media marketing is massive now. That's how everybody yeah, communicates. Is how business advertises. So, why is it nothing changed in the in the um, schooling system to teach you that well, now? Because I, well, it's listen, part you, of life. you mentioned it ten minutes, a few minutes ago. The Matrix. I yeah. think they want everybody controlled, so you don't become better and bigger and whatever. So, 
Yes. So you're in this chip shop. How long did you stay there for? I want to hear some of your side hustles, which made you the man you are. So yeah, take us you know, on that journey. I was there for five years. I was definitely wow. the smelly kid in school. Oh, wow. Um, because you ever go into a fish and chip shop and you come out in your clothes. Yeah. My clothes were in the, t in the top part of this fish and chip shop. And then I wore that school uniform to school. Like everybody must have been going, Tom Smelly. Because wow. the ch fish and chip shop must have stunk my of school course. uniform. Um, that was five years of solid work. And, um, what, what did that teach you in five years? Hard so, work it, pays it, off. You know, it, it really gave me determination in life. Did you ever feel like giving up or was bored of the job? Not a chance, man. I get paid £10 a week. <laughs> £10 a week for working five days. What's that equivalent to today? I don't know, 50 quid, right? Yeah, it's you know, not but bad. For then, it was a shit ton of money it's growing up money. in Northern Ireland. a lot of money for a 12, 13 year old like, now. I was buying myself a t shirt at £3, going, check this guy out. Wow. Thought it was the bomb. Yeah. You know, so. But it really did give me a really good score, sorry, old school values. And at the age of 16, we left school and I became a young roofer and I got an apprenticeship. Then I became a contractor and then it just started. Did you always find you were better with your hands? What got you into roofing? Well, yeah, and here's the thing. What got me into roofing? We were leaving school and my friend said to me, have you heard about this scheme? I'm like, what scheme? He says, it's called the YTP. I'm like, what's that? Youth training. He says, if we leave school and join it, they give us 500 quid. I'm like, you're kidding me. Bang. We're I said, what, what's going? The girl says, would you like to be a roofer? Oh, yeah. 100%. <laughs> Bang. 500 quid. Who's Where's the, the money? <laughs> Check that out. And then we got another 500 quid about three months later. Wow. We all thought we were millionaires. Yes. At the age of 16. Yes. That was 33 years ago. Wow. And and how was you spending your money? Was you appreciating the money that you're earning or was you blowing it on no, materials? Man, I, um, I, I just put that away and saved it. I uh, definitely didn't. Just the thought of having that, because like I was 16, I was working from when I was 10. I knew how hard I had to work. I, I would have had to work 50 weeks to make 500 quid, mm -hmm. getting 10 pound a week. So you was really valuing that money. Yeah, like even just to revert on to something to do with it. Like my young daughter back home is, in, is my world, so is my eldest. But Farah broke her phone once and it was 500 quid to fix the phone. And I went, Farah, your daddy would have to work 50 weeks to fix that she went what that 50 weeks and she went oh my goodness daddy that was the reality check wow. and people just think get that iphone fixed and i'm like i can remember the time 500 quid was my world yes yes you know yes. and you need to have that reality check <clears throat> 100 so what happened after the roofing company did you stay there for long like getting trained up and, and do it as a career or? yeah the roofing company became successful and then i bought my first house um and m m my lads were all laughing at me in the pub. You're buying a house. Yeah, I'm going to buy a house. Wow. And everybody's like, you're crazy. But I sat in the pub and everybody was drinking, looking at property brochures. Brilliant. And then at the age of 18, turning 19, I bought my first house. Wow, that's a, that's a massive accomplishment. Yeah, but here's the best thing about it. I bought my house, 1994. What happened? Both of our sides called peace. So a house that I bought for 30 or 34,000, quadrupled within about 14 months wow. and people were all saying you're a lucky guy no hard work meets opportunity it's called being lucky mm -hmm. i put you, the hard work and i looked at it started going around all these the guys were laughing you're buying a house yeah saved from a deposit bought that house northern ireland found peace and boom that was me started then on the property wow. market wow See, look, people say this thing called luck, but what does luck mean is exactly what you've just explained right mm. there. Because you could have been like the other guys in the pub and going, ha, oh, I'm not going to buy a, a house or I'm spending my money here or doing this. Mm. But you had that thought. You could have easily not put your money there, but you decided to make that move. And then when when some opportunity came across, you reaped it. I was already in it. You, yeah. you, you, you know, there's a famous golfer called Gary Player. And he says, the harder I work, the, the luckier, luckier I get. get. Boom. <laughs> And it's a fact. <laughs> love it, love it. it. So, so, so what happened, right? So this house for 33, did you say? 33. 33, like so it's like, so it's gone to like nearly 90,000. Did you know what to do with it? Did you sell it? Did yeah, you no, refinance like, it? No, what, what I done next was I sold it and then I bought a house that really well, well, half wealthy middle class people would live in. Wow. I bought this gorgeous four bedroom detached house and like, Housewives of Northern Ireland type of stuff. It was all all these lovely families, and some young dude at twenty years old was living in this house because I just seen the property investment was my way forward, mm -hmm. and it was, and I stuck to it, and you know, it was an income-producing asset, 
and then it went up with it because the boom kept continuing. 100. And what was you doing alongside this at that time? So when you bought this house, you rented it out, what else was you doing? I was buying houses that were wrecked. You see, you know, we were growing up in a, in a world where we were just coming out of a war. Mm. We were, there was so much opportunity. Wow. The boom was going on. You were yeah. buying houses for maybe 50 grand, selling them for 150 grand, wow. spending 50 on it, flipping it. There was young estate agents who were friends that were only starting off. I was buying stuff off them. And it was just, I was living the life of my wildest dreams. And one of the nice things was, at the age of 18, I realized alcohol didn't work for me. Mm -hmm. So I didn't drink when I was a young guy. Mm -hmm. I made that mistake in later years which I'm sure you'll want to cover. Wow. But as the young guy, I never drank. I was always in it to win it. So when the guys were in the pub, do you want a vodka? No, apple juice. What? Apple juice or a Diet Coke, please. Yes. You know, and I didn't care about anybody else's opinion. I care about mine. Mm. But you say that, but everybody nowadays is looking outwards for love. They're not looking for within. They're looking for... Um, they're looking for somebody else to, to, to give you that sort of... You know, mm. it's okay for you to do that rather than, no, I'm doing this. Mm. So like, it's for example, I want to go to the gym and people call you crazy because I do it six, maybe seven times because it's my happy place. If, if you don't mm. go to the gym, I've had a bad day. And when it's my rest day, I'm looking at the window going, I wish I was at the gym because yeah. it's, it's where I love. But, but for somebody else, if I listen to other people, they're like, you're crazy. You're going to do yourself injury. Oh, why are you doing this? Don't you have a life? But they're judging you by their own failures yes. and probably hating to see you being successful and happy and fit and healthy. You know, I do not listen to the opinion of sheep. A wolf makes his own decisions. Yeah. I make mine. Mm. I create my own luck. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Look, what's your training regime like? Because you look very, very fit for your age as well. You look like what a 20, you mean, 20, 20, 21. <laughs> you, look like a, I've, you look better than 21 year olds, for God's sake. Yeah. You're like, I know you can do the, the steps. You, you're in very good condition. What does yeah. it take to, to get in this peak uh, performance? Uh, you know, it's, it's not about a 12 week or a 16 week physique course. It's a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Like I eat really healthy. Um, one day a week, I'll eat anything that's not nailed down, donuts, you know, whatever. Yeah. But it, it has to be a lifestyle. I want to turn up feeling sharp as a tack when me and you are meeting and you're noticing that. Mm -hmm. You know, my cardio is through the roof. Mm -hmm. I'll definitely put on a bit of size after this big stir event that I'm doing tomorrow. But I eat, sleep and breathe it. You know, it, it's all about self-development, self-love. Self-love isn't just loving yourself eternally. It's about loving yourself enough that you're looking after your skin, your hair, your body. Mm -hmm. Why would you not? No. You have to love yourself. And mm -hmm. for me, loving myself is looking after my body because I want to be, um, like my daughter's having a baby, my eldest daughter. I'm going to be a granda. I want to live to see that baby grow up. My, mm -hmm. That's going to be my little granddaughter. Yes. I have to protect myself so then I can be a good granda. How important, it's is, all it, how, how important is your parents when you walk into a room that you're feeling aesthetically that you're looking good? Does that give you more confidence? Yeah, well, you know, let's be real. You know, vanity is something that's quite normal. You should be vain. You should want to turn up where somebody's impressed that you're sharp. A guy's razor sharp. He's on the ball. Nice appearance. Because if you've got a company or a brand, you are your company. You are your brand. You know, people want to do business with a male or female person who turns up and is taking pride in their in, in the way they look. Of course, and like let's be real. I'm not, a, and I'm not being bad. If somebody turns up a scruff, say no more. You know, <laughs> do, do they value themselves? Probably no. Do they value you then as a client? Probably not. They you need know. to look after the vehicle first yeah. to give outward love to something of else. Etc. Wow. And I've also got a beautiful wife that I want to make sure that she's still happy with this dude here. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> she will be bad. There's a little competition going on, maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, we both train probably 10 or 12 times a week each. Wow. Wow. Yeah, she trains twice a day. I train twice a day. That. What does that do for your brain? Forget your physical appearance. What does it do for your brain training? Huge release. Like, you know, um, a massive boost for confidence. Really amazing for your mental health cardio and vascular fitness too like i've dropped a bit of size recently because i'm doing so much cardio but my strength is still right there on point through the roof and um it also really helps your confidence people think oh my goodness that's a confident guy confidence is like going to the gym it takes constant work but being healthy helps that it's just win, win, win. It's all a work in progress. You've got to put yeah. the ingredients in all the time with consistency over time. You and will it's, get there. It's like, it's like going after goals. 
you know, people are like, well, you know, it isn't working. It isn't working yet. Mm. Keep going. Then you'll start seeing the results, mm. whether it's in the gym, in the work, in the self-development. Mm. People just do that too much. Tap out. Stop tapping out. Keep keep going. Love that. I love that. It's funny. We just had MVP Michael Venom Page. He's one of the number one Bellator's champion here the other day. Right. So you're talking about MMA and tapping out. This well, I, I coached Molly McCann yeah. from UFC for two years. Oh wow. Molly Meatball. Yeah. How was that? Amazing. Yeah. Um, a totally incredible, amazing female entrepreneur that I had the you know the the, the chance and the luck to work with. She's still a very close friend of mine, and now she's became a superstar. Mm. Um, she, she, she has always been the amazing athlete. All I done was help her with her mindset training. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm very proud to see her implement it. I did a session with her um, in London before she won with a spinning elbow and things like that. Um, but she was, you know, like a daughter to me. The two of us are that close. Oh, bless. You know, and uh, she's the pride of Liverpool. And, um, and for, uh, you know, for me, I just love seeing another woman be a female warrior. It's a big thing. She's just an amazing athlete and such a funny, amazingly educated person too. She's a very clever woman. Nice. Proud nice. to call her my friend. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Tom, let's go a little bit back to your story. So you're in your early 20s. You become a property entrepreneur where mm-hmm. you're buying, doing up houses, flipping them. Did you have to create, did you have to leverage people at that time? Did you have to get builders involved, banks yeah, involved? Well, how, yeah, how did you know about all of that stuff? I, I just, I always learned on my feet, you know, um, I ended up with a thing called a hunting line where I could just walk in, sign a check and buy a house. Um, I had a team of guys doing stuff for me and very quickly you'll go through people who are unreliable and you'll end up with a brilliant team. So we have brilliant plasters, tailors, sparks. But then I remember doing a house in Belfast and I was about to sell it for 250000 Now, this is in a part of Belfast that at one time you could have bought houses for £5,000 right. during the war. And I remember then everything just crashed and the credit crunch came and it was like, oh my goodness, what the world just ended back 2007, 2008. So then I decided I'm not going to let this environment control me. It's go time. And I disappeared and went to Dubai for a few years and I was doing land deals and stuff over there. Um, But when I was living in Dubai, it's not the Dubai that you guys see. I'm talking, there were seven towers. It was called the original seven in the marina. There was Jumeirah Beach Hotel and the Burj Al Arab. There was no downtown. Sheikhside Road had hardly anything on it. Mm-hmm. It was just desert. Um, but I lived in a hotel, the famous hotel called the Grosvenor House. There's a the Grosvenor House in London, Grosvenor House in Dubai. But half of the hotel was a hotel and half was service departments. Right. So I fell in love with this service department idea. Mm-hmm. So when I came back to Ireland, I came back with the idea, I'm going to open an apart hotel. So for a whole year, I come back and I walk the streets. And this is the bit that I want everybody to get. It's about resilience. It's about never giving up. Because I'd been away, people didn't like you then. I oh, sure Tom's away in Dubai. Who does he think he is? Mm-hmm. You know, the small mentality. Yes. So I decided no matter what happens, I'm going to do this. So I walk the streets of Belfast, Ireland, the UK, major cities, Liverpool, London, Birmingham. I put boots on the ground and wrap the doors made the phone calls, shook the hands, sent the emails, but I was told no for a year. And resilience just kept making me stronger and stronger. And my wife says to me one time, when are you gonna give up? And I said, give up? Are you for real? No chance, I'm never giving up. Mm. And I can remember being in DW gym, which are closed now, these gyms. Fitness first. Yeah, well, it was like the the new birth from it. And uh, a friend of mine called me from Savills International Estate Agents and said, there is a company called Marathon from New York, a New York hedge fund's coming to Belfast. They've bought a ghost building with 280 flats. It's the highest building in all of Ireland. And I'm like, I know, they know everything about you. And I'm like, let's go. Mm. And I remember being in the gym with my friend coming and he says, um, Marathon said no. And I'm like, what? And I was devastated because this was probably 200 no's in at this stage. He said, they've said no to a five year deal but yes, they are three. Wow. And I can remember bursting out crying in the middle of the gym with wow. gratitude. I'm like, let's fucking have this. And I got 49 in one building. The big tower, I got 25. I took the penthouses, the duplexes on the 25th floor. I took all the 20th floor and my company was born. And I realized then resilience and never giving up works. Dream Apartments was born. 
and then I got Newcastle, Liverpool, Manchester, Dundee, Middlesbrough. We're opening in Bradford. So and for anybody out there, if you do want something, <laughs> it took me a year to get my first yes. You know, it didn't just happen. It took me a year and it fucking worked. But it was a big yes. When you yeah, but it. how many punches can you take? Mm. People now give up so easily. They do. Like I took a year of nose, a year. But it was the making of me. That kid at 10 years old, mm. he was the guy taking the nose. Mm. The resilience was born then. Mm. And um, I'm so glad I stuck it out. Yes, yes, you know? yes. I can feel that. So serviced apartments so people who don't understand that is that taking a property and then making it into like a mini hotel for people to come yeah, and stay well, in a serviced apartment can be one flat i do it in blocks so logistically we're just like a hotel um instead of having a pepper potted about the place and you're going to that flat and that flat and that flat that's chaos i like being organized yeah. so we take a full block 50 flats or 100 flats or whatever and um, you just come in like a normal hotel. How you doing, sir? Nice to see you. What's your name? Check you in. Thank you for staying with us. Our business model is about 80 to 90% corporate. We give you the keys, you're staying. It's a home from home living. You've got super fast Wi-Fi. You can eat very cheaply because you're cooking for yourself. You can have family time on Zoom, talking to your family if you're away. Lovely. And then you've got a separate bedroom because living in a hotel room isn't everything it's made out to be. Oh. Um, and yeah, it's became, it's given me the most amazing life. Yes. And, uh, you, it looks like you've mastered your craft in it. You, you've just itemized the whole thing that a lot of property guys couldn't, you know, well, right yeah, now. And I've been in it from the start and I know every move in the book, but I also know every mistake. And one of the big things for us was during COVID, the world stopped as we all knew it. Mm -hmm. uh, we lost six million pound in two weeks. Wow. Our booking chart just stopped and fell off the cliff. Excuse me. Then what happened? We were forced by Booking.com to give hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of refunds. And I'm like, like we've just paid you millions in commission over the last couple of years. And Booking.com forced everybody in the hotel industry to give refunds. Mm. So we were very lucky that, that we had a very strong cash flow. Mm -hmm. As hotels all started closing across the UK, the lucky thing for me was in the, I was in the right place at the right time. I own service departments. Boris Johnson allowed us to be open. Wow. We provided accommodation for emergency workers, guys building Amazon, wow. construction. And the next thing we stopped surviving and started thriving. Then what did I do? I didn't want to look back two years during COVID and say, I wish you would have done this and that. And my wife says, are you going to really do it? I'm like, yeah, 100%. Because I had wrote these goals like my life depended on it. Yeah. And what happened? The mighty universe delivered the goals. And I expanded by another 250 apartments right in the middle of COVID. Wow. And we filled all the rooms. Um, and I was so proud that my sales team made all the calls, but I walked the streets of the UK myself. I was walking in the building site saying, can I have your number? And the four men were saying, I've got contractors coming in. They were WhatsApping me. And I mean, every city in the UK, I walked the streets of the UK on my own and I filled those buildings. Mm. Now, my amazing sales team, Andrew Donaldson and Sean, and I had another girl, Bethany, working for me. They got on the calls, but I wasn't prepared to ask those guys to travel during COVID. I did the traveling. Because mm. I had a duty occur with my staff too. I also had a duty occur with my family to keep us the life that we had. So I wasn't going to furlough myself and furlough my staff. <laughs> I stepped up. Yeah. And I remember a couple of times, and excuse my language, I said, I'm going to fucking war with COVID. Let's have it. <laughs> let's go let's fucking go <laughs> so it is I won wow wow well, pff, I don't even know what to say about that like what's your thoughts on manifestation I don't believe it okay I do believe th thoughts can become things yeah but I write goals like my life depends on it yep. I write goals in the pretense that they've already happened mm -hmm. I train all my clients to do this but it'd be like me just wanting to manifest doing this podcast for you. It's connecting, it's the text messages, it's the friendship, it's the taking of the massive action, hands you make shake, calls you make. I will wrap doors, I'll walk the streets. I make my goals happen. Mm. Like here's an example. I didn't manifest that amazing man, Grant Caron, doing a, a job for us and, and doing a public speaking event. That amazing man, no. I sent the email, I connected with his team, I followed up probably made 50 to 60 phone calls. Mm. I was on Zoom. You know, we were agreeing emails, we were agreeing terms, having a couple of little arguments that we got to that point. That's not manifesting. No. 
That's massive action. Action. Massive action works. You don't go to the gym and manifest a six pack. You earn that six pack. Mm. So you're like, my Lambo at the house, I did not manifest that motherfucker. I worked for it. You know. One I love that. I love that. Analogy. I'm going to manifest this Instagram <laughs> life. Bollocks. It's not going to happen for you. No. You can't just, you've got to make something in your mind. You've got to put it on paper and see it. Make something of it. Put some colors on it. Put some branding, some some names onto it. So somebody else can see it to yeah. attract it, and right? You know, when I'm saying things like thoughts become things, I mean, if you're living in a negative environment, you're going to attract negative things. Mm -hmm. If you go to a different frequency of positivity, you're going to attract positive things. You're not going to attract a Lambo turning up. Yes. Hard work brings the Lambo. Yes. I want to ask a little uh, personal question because I know you said you bought one of your first houses at 1994 and then to 2007 the crash sort of came. How much of a wealth did you build up in that period? Can you share? Six million or something. Um, yeah, there was times that, you know, when you look at it now, it was so false what was going on. You were going, prices have went up again and you were adding the calculation of houses you had and you're like, I've just made 250,000 today. Mm -hmm. And when you look start, standing back, that was never going to last. And what is the difference between having 6 million in assets and actually 6 million in the bank, for example? Because people get confused between the two. Yeah, 6 the million two. in assets is there in bricks and mortar. 6 million in the bank is a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. If I'm buying a piece of land off you, I can show there's proof of funds. It's liquid, it's real, and you're like, wow, let's go. It's sitting there in liquid. That's what it's all about. Like if I'm doing, if I'm doing a property deal with somebody, we will produce proof of funds showing how real we are. Yeah. And then if we decide that we want to use funding, that's our choice. Yeah. But right away, it brings the guy to the table who's the real deal, mm. instead of the guy who's talking in millions that hasn't got a washer. Yes, one hundred. So liquid. So it, it, it definitely authenticates you. 100, yeah. 100, because people sometimes don't get it. They're like, when you say I've got 10 million property portfolio, they think you've got 10 million in your bank. No, it doesn't no. work like that. You may be producing 25,000 a month. What's that, 300,000 a year? That's but then what having money means. sitting in the bank, you need a certain element of it to be liquid. But you also want to have money going into development sites and you're building, like I'm building houses in the, at the minute in Leeds. Yeah. I'd rather be building those houses and making more money yeah. than I just sitting in a bank. Yeah, Tom, why are you building in Leeds? Why is that area attracting you right now? Well. I had an amazing client called Matthew Reynolds. I was, his, I was his coach for a year in the Dream Man Tour in one to one. This kid is just a complete and utter genius. He says to me about, eight, let me see, this is June nearly, about 13 months ago, Tom, I want to be a property developer. I'm like, really? Are you sure? It's intense. And I sent them bills of quantities, I sent them architect drawings, I explained everything with GDV meant and all the different terminologies. I sent them solicitor's letters, every detail that I've done on all my projects. I've showed them the mistakes that I've made. I've showed them the square footage that should have been allowed for in a lift shaft that was missed. I taught them all this stuff. I then started loving him like he was my son. He's now became my business partner. I'm very proud to call him one of my best friends. I actually wrote a goal for me to team up with him and another amazing guy who's became a close friend called Joe Carter. And now these guys are my business, uh, they're my business partners. And we've got an amazing friendship. They're textbook property developers mm -hmm. who are just brilliant at it. Matthew's only been in it, like, you know, about six months now. And I could put him into a room with anybody and he'll hold his own. Wow. So the opportunity come up, I stabbed him with my experience. Joe has a lot of experience from working with his dad. And I, I, we'll just have this most amazing triangle relationship between the three of us. And it's just gonna grow stronger and stronger and stronger. So watch this space up in Leeds. <laughs> How do you find a really good business partner? Because sometimes you can jump into the bed with the wrong person. You see, I don't. Um, I, I had, I've had two business partners um, that were very close to me. One was a guy called Billy that I was in service departments with. Um, and I loved this man. He was like a, a young dad to me. And um, he fucking stole money from me, like a shit ton of money. And uh, it didn't even make me angry. I was so, I was really disappointed and heartbroken because I looked up to him like he was James Bond. He was the coolest guy. When I was running about in Dubai, I was running about with him. And see if he would have wanted the money, I'd have given him the money. Because yeah. we were doing very well. But see when he took it from me, it was so sad. Um, 
So that business partnership did not work. The next thing, I opened Dream. He, he went that way, I went that way. The sad thing is now he died. Um, I also had a business partner called Gary, who was my best friend. And when I see a sunset at night, the day Gary died, there was a beautiful sunset. Mm -hmm. And we built houses together. We built three gorgeous developments. Two of the developments he never got seen were finished. And uh, he was about six foot six. He was a Liverpool fan. He was the funniest guy I've ever met. If I wanted to burst into the office to have an argument with him about something, he'd have said, shut up, cheese ball, or something. And he'd have said, them, and I'm like, what did, you, what did you call me? Cheese ball? And uh, he, was such, he was such a character. And I was so proud, and still am very proud to call him my business partner, even though he's passed. Um, he was my best friend. He's dead two years this summer. And uh, he was the best thing that ever helped me. He would have given me the shoes off his feet. Mm. He would have given me the last five pound out of his pocket. Mm. And uh, his wife, Kelly, is the most amazing woman. His two little girls are amazing kids. And um, I really miss him. Like, mm. You know, I really, really miss him. I can imagine. So how do you find that synergy with a person? So like, there's so many people who want to form business partnerships. I know I've had a, a business partnership during COVID. I set up a restaurant. Me and him didn't get along. Once mm. we we were good on the phone for a year, trading on the, the stocks and shares, yeah. analytical stuff. But as soon as we was in the kitchen together and the money started rolling in, he had other plans. When I'm like, hey, you got to reinvest into a business to grow this. Of course. He wanted to strip it and start putting it into other things. I'm like, you're going to kill the business. We ended up conflicting and mm. I just had to get my accountant to get me off everything. I'm like, get me off as soon as possible yeah. before this yeah. company goes down yeah. and spoils my name. Yeah. How do you not be in that position? You have to choose carefully. Like I have another business partner um, called Stuart Hurd. Um, we own a company called Empire Invest. And I love this kid. You know, he is, he's the ultimate guy on, on selling off plan property. But we both have the same values in life. He's a stand up guy. He's an amazing family man. He's not good at what he does. He's amazing at what he does. He drips with professionalism. He goes to the gym. He looks after himself. You know, and we both have a mutual understanding of what we both want. You know, he doesn't want to take money off my table. I don't want to take money off his. Mm -hmm. We have vision and clarity of where we're going with stuff mm -hmm. instead of having that small mindedness. Yeah. Is it important to have different skills when you're in a partnership? Of course. Like, you know, especially like I'm not I'm not an iPod or a laptop guy, but like I can I am definitely a sales guy. Mm -hmm. I will make people see the bigger picture and show them things in a different way. Mm -hmm. Everybody, you want to be bringing different qualities to the table so you bounce off each other. Mm -hmm. So today you're, are you, you're still in the service department sort of field? I am. With your partners. What else do you do? I do the service department. I build apartments and houses. I build social housing back home in Northern Ireland for the government, wow. um, for people that have a social need. Um, I have wrote a book, Fearless, which has became a world success. Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about this book. So what's this book? Thank you for the gift, by the way. Tom's gifted my us this. Brother, yeah. And I think it's one for my 16-year-old cameraman also. But um, tell us more about this. What, what is this? Yeah, you know, just to finish on what you asked me, but, you know, I also do the dream mentoring, the self-development, the public speaking. I see the mentoring and stuff. It is definitely going to be the next legacy. Um, coaching people from a business what, point what, of view. Why? Why? Why can't you just close the curtains? You've made your money. You've got your private jets. You've got your Lambos. You've got money around you. You've got your family. Why do you need to come out? Man, I need to wake up with the hustle and a reason to get up in the mornings. Mm -hmm. My idea of retiring or something like that mm -hmm. is a nightmare scenario for me. You know, I work in England three days a week, every week. I've got a very supportive wife. I'm meeting one-to-one -one clients. I'm watching those guys skyrocket. I'm forming partnerships with people. I like keeping myself busy. It makes me super happy. Mm -hmm. If I just stopped, it would be very bad for me, to be honest. Mm -hmm. You know, I am um, a recovering alcoholic and I like my diary being packed with no spaces. So I have no time to really... Recovering alcoholic. So you said you wasn't drinking in the past. And then what happened? Well, I didn't drink uh, from when I was a kid. But at the age of 30, I found alcohol. I thought this is brilliant. Alcohol made me feel like... What was that first introduction into alcohol at the age of 30? I just felt like a rock star. You know, I, I did five years working in a nightclub, running the front door, and probably the best house club in Northern Ireland. In Ireland, maybe. It was called the Network Club. Um, so I was working for five years, running the door. You had politics and all going on. 
you know, people pulling guns, all that type of stuff. It was proper hurry stuff. But at the age of 30, I found alcohol and I thought, this is amazing. I was out on the scene, met this amazing girl, got married, had a little girl. And then I started realizing alcohol didn't work for me. Then I started feeling alcohol trying to control me. Yeah. Then alcohol did got, got grab a hold of me. Yeah. And then I thought a situation will control me or I will control it. I started going to AA, started following a 12 step program. I'm now nine years in recovery. I have had a lot of falls on the journey, but my sober addy is my superpower. Like I'm sitting here with you today, you became my friend. If you open a bag now and offer me 200 million to have a drink, I'll laugh at you. Yeah. You know, I've also found, I know I might still curse, but I've found God, I've found internal peace. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't need alcohol. I don't need anything. I've got God, I've got gratitude, I've got my wife and kids. That's why I do all the work. D does alcohol do anything for you? Not a chance. I hate it, nah. I don't mind anybody having a drink, it's just not for me. Mm -hmm. Alcohol nearly destroyed me. Mm -hmm. Isn't it part of your, like, you know... Because we're Irish. <laughs> I mean, isn't, isn't it part of your, you know, I think you've read my mind, like, you could be from a certain background that of it's course. A, every celebration is cheers, and if you haven't of done course. it, you're not well, en no. enjoying with us. Our culture is like, why are you not drinking? Yeah. But everybody knows, now nah, I don't drink. Yeah. And it's having the courage to step up and say, for any young kids, don't take drugs. You don't need the cigarette. Don't have the beer. If you don't want to do it, say no. Like, I know that used to be a, sl a saying years ago, just say no, but... But then what if that kid is saying, I feel alone now, I feel like I'm, I'm missing out, everyone else is doing it, but I don't want to do the things that you want to do, but then I'm, I'm being casted out. Fine, no, but they're not really your friends. If they're casting out, find a different mm -hmm. circle of friends. You know, like, I'm very lucky the friends I grew up with are still my friends, but none of them judge me. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I believe social media has played a massive part mm -hmm. on that, where people feel judged. 100. Um, so if you do really feel bad under peer pressure, I think you need to change your peers. Mm -hmm. Tom, um, another big topic or everything well, that's coming into fruition right now is chat GPT, AI. Yeah, artificial yeah. intelligence. Yeah, like yeah. You can ask this AI, give me 20 things to speak about on this podcast. Brrr, yeah. Ask these questions. Yeah. And it's, it's used Google, everything from... So people can set up, be ready for meetings within two minutes now. What, what's your take on AI? technology and as we keep evolving and becoming more amazing in life it's incredible um i suppose for me if i'm going to be doing a webinar or i'm going to be doing a talk it's coming from my heart it's coming from my mind it's coming from my dna and like you're a clever guy i believe people see the real person who's really talking and it's coming from their heart instead of somebody it. going that doesn't even feel real yeah. yeah, because AI just created it. I think AI is amazing technology for industry and everything else. It might be amazing for somebody writing a solution or a, a description on a property. But if you want to deliver a message to impress people from your heart, don't hit AI. Write your own notes and put the work in. Mm -hmm. Do you That's think, just my opinion. Do you think AI is changing the world and in the next 10, 20 years, it will be a different world from what of we're course. seeing it right now? I'm 49. Could, yeah. See if you'd have told me at 20. <laughs> You're going to have a phone, you're going to speak to a girl or a guy called Siri, and it's going to tell you stuff. That's your <laughs> cell phone. Really? I, yes. You know, that guy, something wrong with him. Mm. Look at technology. Technology is changing the world. Yeah. You know, I think it's amazing. Yes. You know, people take it for granted. I grew up and there was none. Mm. Um, it just keeps, I just hope people don't get too caught up on it. Let's go back to what you said. In the present moment, no phone, sunset, enjoy your breakfast, live in the present moment. Keep it real. What's been your biggest failure? What's been my biggest failure? Wow, great question. I think one of my failures is definitely not being around enough to see my daughters. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also doing it for a reason. You know, there's times where I'll see my wife's face too and even the disappointment on it that I'm getting another flight. But you know, if I do what is hard now, our life will be easy. Mm -hmm and it really does change everything. I'm not being a selfish person to it. There's times I'll be getting onto a flight and I'll, uh, if the flight isn't that full, there's times I'll burst out crying. I'm like, fucking hell, I really miss my kids. You know, people don't see that side of the entrepreneur. They just see some dude who's on jets, in gyms, running stairs. Yeah. Um, if, I could, if I could have spent more time with those kids growing up, I definitely would have done it. Um, so I suppose when my granddaughter comes, 
It's going to be amazing. It's going to be different. But um, yeah, that's just my my two daughters in my world, and mm-hmm. I, if I could have given them more time, I definitely would. Mm-hmm. How do you deal with setbacks? Make your setbacks your get backs. You know, take a step back, learn from it, move on. Yep. Here's the thing: failure is part of the process. Yeah. Failure is not a negative thing. Fail, learn, move forward. I make mistakes every single day, but I learn from them. You know, failure will always be there. Mm -hmm. It's not this horrible negative word. Fail and keep going. Mm -hmm. What does Denzel say, Denzel Washington? Fail forward. It isn't negative. Learn from your mistakes. You can even turn it into a training session. Guys, we've just made a huge mistake here. I want to show everybody where we went wrong. Do you understand? Okay, great. So we're never going to make this mistake again. Have we all learned from it? Brilliant. That's a positive. Own it. Yes. Own it. We say that, you know, failure is not the opposite to success. It's part of success. Of course. You know, how many times have we had to fail to be this version of of ourselves? We have to keep I've had burrito bars, car washes, you know, restaurants. (laughs) Everything. How do you keep reinventing yourself? It's just there. It's just that burning desire. You know, I, one of the, I write a, a daily thing called a mantra. And one of the sentences I write in this, about this amazing guy, which is me. Mm-hmm. I write about this amazing guy, so I always turn up. It puts me back in the line. It's like putting my armour on. I always write, I am constantly evolving and becoming the best version of me. Mm-hmm. Which means on a daily basis I'm getting better, but making mistakes and learning from them. And I write all these things. I'm an amazing dad. I've went from magazines to movie scenes. I'm a man that makes things happen. Everything I touch yeah. turns to gold. All this type well, of stuff. How did you get into the Rise of the Foot Soldier? Um, Terry Stone and I um, got connected. I am very good friends with an amazing man called Keith Bishop. Keith Bishop is Johnny Depp's PR manager. Wow. And uh, Mr. Bishop is the most amazing man. He's called the King of Soho. And he runs a huge global PR business because obviously Johnny Depp's one of his clients. And when I'm writing a goal, I will keep pushing and pushing until the goal becomes a reality. Now, this is business. and business, you're supposed to push. So I kept calling Keith saying, listen, I want to meet Terry, I want to meet Terry. And he went, oh, fuck's sake, Tom. So then he connected us. Me and Terry went and we had lunch for about three hours at Annabelle's. I have also wrote a film. I sent the film to Terry. He loved the story. I said to Terry, look, why don't you come on the mentoring program? This amazing man who's made 33 films, successful actor, producer, you know, director, has become my friend. I've coached him. And since then, we've become very good friends. You know, I've, I've been at red carpets. I've acted in a film. But I wrote that goal that I was going to act in a film. And wow. it's now became reality. Wow. So, and I'm, I've been picked for the next three movies as well. Wow. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it was great. What part did you Totally. Play? Oh, man. Um, so... My wife kept texting me saying, what's your part? I'm like, oh no. <laughs> so we're in this strip club. The guys are walking in with guns and stuff. And I walk over to the stage and speak to the stripper. Oh, wow. And I say, I give her 50 pound and say, there's a lot more where that comes from, love. <laughs> Do you want to come home with me tonight? And I'm the drunken punter and she kicks me away. Oh, wow. And, I, and my wife says, so tell me what your part is. And I'm oh, like, oh, wow. fuck. <laughs> I think Carrie done this on purpose. But do you know what it is too? Everybody sees movies and thinks it's all this really slick stuff. To to make about 10 minutes of footage, it takes 10 hours. Like, you know that as an editor. Like, it's insane. So, you know, the respect I have for anybody in that industry, it is insane. Um, And I I was standing there, and just before I did it, my internal voice said, you can't do this, Tom. And I'm like, I know who you are. You're (laughs) self-doubt. Get out of my head. And I just stepped up and done it in one cut. Um, because it's all about getting comfortable, being uncomfortable. And now that I've done that once, I want to do a lot more of it. I really enjoyed it. So watch your space. Oh, this is absolutely been an amazing uh, podcast. I know we don't have much time, but before we finish up, I know you wanted to speak a little bit about your mentoring program. All right, tell, us, much, tell, yeah. tell us a little bit about that, how people what it consists of what people would get from it you know how does it all come well, yeah, about yeah dream mentoring is my amazing new business it's been going now for the last couple of years through covid and stuff but it's a self-development course that isn't like other courses it helps for self-development it helps for business it helps for everything it's a 16-week course we're live on zoom on a monday night at five o'clock where i do a coaching session mentoring all these amazing people and helping them go to the next level which is the most amazing thing for me watching others win and then on a thursday i have another zoom which is a troubleshooting q a where you can bring 
business related or self-development questions and I'll give you the answers to it. I'm also on WhatsApp with everybody six days a week. I spark the WhatsApp group up at 4 a.m. or 3.45 a.m. Guys, what's happening? Let's go. Early mornings is where it's at. And everybody can see it's on the programme. How real is this guy? He's up at 3.45 or he's up at 4. I'm encouraging others to realise it really does start in the in the in that nice cool part of the morning where you've got your goals, gratitude, and mantra. The day belongs to you. Mm. And I'm mentoring coaching these people. I've went from UFC stars, the movie directors, the multi-millionaire business people, the multi-million pound dentistry companies in Miami. I'm training some of the amazing staff in Securitas, the biggest security company in the world. I'm sales training these guys. I do huge sales training, motivational workshops, dream mentoring one-to-one working with clients bespokely and specifically. And it for me, it's so rewarding to see others win. And like I know my saying is winners win, but it's a fact. And um, who knows what's coming next, but mm-hmm. it's going global, huge public speaking events, associations and deals and events with Grant Cardone. Who knows what's coming? Tony Robbins next, massive, let's go. Massive, massive, I love it. Just out of that, can I ask you, what's the biggest barrier to people being reaching their success to get yeah, to the next well level. there's a couple of things you know recently I've had a lot of people say to me how do you get motivated I'm like I'm not motivated I'm disciplined, disciplined. but I also realise through teaching people it takes 30 to 40 days for something to become a habit so like somebody doesn't wake up somebody who gets up at 5am it will take them over a month for that to become their normal mm-hmm. and that's what people don't realise and what we both spoke earlier on don't tap out keep going so it's about people realizing that discipline has to take over if if they want the instagram life they need to go and get it suppose the biggest barrier like you just mentioned is also self-doubt people thinking and listening to that negative little thing like i wrote fearless an antidote to self-doubt because you've got this internal negative voice of your bad self-talk you can't do this you're not good enough it's about knocking that little duck off your shoulder and saying I can do this, I am good enough, I am worthy, I am capable, I will do whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. And changing your self-talk instead of sabotaging your own future. Mm -hmm. Like the biggest fight you will ever fight is you against you. Mm -hmm. And I've chose to win. Mm. I love that, I love that. Is there any question that you wish I asked you? No, I think you've been absolutely amazing. Yes. Well, look, Tom. Can I ask you something? Yes, yes, please. Is there anything I can do for you today? Is there anything you can do for me? Yeah. I'm, I'm really happy. You know, I'm really happy right. that you came today, that I'm sitting in your presence. You've shared your story. My audience gets to listen to somebody who's really successful. You've done m- more than enough and over and beyond. So I can only just thank you for that. My you pleasure. know, and because you just came through a contact through Terry Stone. He came. Um, actually, there is one thing. That's it. There is one thing. I'm not sure if we can talk about it on on camera or not, but I always ask my guess that please could you refer me one more person in your network who you think you know would sh- should come on this um on this podcast so have a little think and maybe, I will, yeah. maybe a little bit of time and say hey look i know a really good person because this is what keeps this channel going of course is a network and and all we're trying to do is i'm somebody similar to yourself on a lot smaller scale who come from nothing in a dad's corner shop and worked himself up to become a property entrepreneur and it's not finished i want to dedicate the rest of my life i'm 37. Mm. i want to spend don't look the, you look like younger. <laughs> but good diet yeah. good training but i want to spend the rest of my life in influencing people and yeah. show them it can be done because well i've done. come from nothing yeah. and do you know what i really love my journey because yeah. some of the best days when i had no money that's where i refer yeah. back to yeah. when i had nothing yeah. it, i was a nobody yeah. and i was on my grind i was working mcdonald's 24 hours like yeah. night times with sweaty burgers yeah. and stuff i don't have to do that no more and like my kids will never experience that life you know yeah. I, and how do i put that belief into them you know like you're waking up in a silk robe but you still gotta want to get up and do and have a purpose of course but i know yeah. i'm already doing my job because my little nine-year-old he'll open his wallet and go yeah dad how much money do you need yeah. because he knows i need to play the piano when somebody comes around oh, wow. i'll earn some tips yeah. my yeah. birthday money is going to a side and now i can buy that united top if i want to yeah. you know I, I'm, I'm bringing them up you need to you, have money you brought I'm them not, up properly i'm say. not giving it to you of and course. that's my proof i don't need to prove who i am i'm already doing it because i'm bringing up little go. entrepreneurs yeah. already and you know not all fingers are same so all my children are different of course you know 
and the middle child is always difficult, but I'm still working on him. I, yeah. I do not give up, you know, etc. But yeah, look, what I'm just trying to say, fa- thank you for coming on. If you Pleasure. just speak straight into your camera, uh, Tom, and let everybody know how they follow you. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Thank you so much, guys. My name is Tom Smith. It's S M Y T H. I'm on Instagram. Watch out for the fake accounts. I think I've got 39,000 followers. Soon to have the blue tick. I am Tom Smith. Um, Dream Apartments on LinkedIn, TikTok, Instagram, Flip Flop, Tinder. Only joking. Um, <laughs> and thank you. Um, if you want to reach out, send me a DM. Thanks a lot. There you go, guys. I hope you really enjoyed this podcast. Our guests are getting better and better and we're giving you a lot more value. So don't forget to smash the like button. Leave us a comment. Leave Tom a comment. I'll message him on WhatsApp and get that answer for you. Share this podcast and people really need to hear this message. So I'll see you on the next one. Peace. Boom. Boom. <laughs> That's a wicked I